In fact, there might even be some dysfunctional people in this room right now because I'm going to be transparent with you. I've never met anybody that didn't have some dysfunction. It's like I always say, some people just have a little more funk than others, you know, but all of us have a little dysfunction in our life. But how many of you know the choices we make in life is everything to do with how we live life? And uh, so often we forget that we live in a world that is really trying to take the God from us that we love so much. And let me say this openly. It's not because they want to, they just don't know any better. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's getting so dark in our world and there's so much going on. But the Bible tells me that where darkness is, light much more abounds. And the Word says that we are the light of the world, a candle that is lit, not to be put under a bushel, but to be set on the candlestick that all that are in the house may see of its light. Now I say that because we've been talking about, in the last few weeks, we've been doing a series called A Made Up Mind. In fact, just look at your neighbor and say, your problem sets on the top of your neck. Just go ahead and tell them that. In love, now do it in love. But how many of you know that that is really... <laughs> Some of you are enjoying that too much. I'm not quite sure about that. But, uh, you know, so often we don't recognize, but really our problem begins a lot of times without having a renewed mind because we don't renew our mind to what God's Word tells us who we are and what we have from His Son, Jesus Christ. So often thoughts try to be captivated and take things from us that actually are ours and promises of ours. Yet at the same time, how many of you know we all have to renew our mind every day and we all have to stay in that power and that anointing of being persuaded? Because how many of you know we live in a world today that if you're not persuaded, I guarantee you, you will vacillate or you will drift in any direction that comes through your life. When I do not believe we live by chance, but we live by divine appointment, for our steps are ordered by the Lord, according to Scripture. So we don't live by luck and we don't live by chance, but we live by divine appointment with God. And Paul in Romans, in fact, you don't have to turn there, but turn to Joshua, if you would, the first chapter, or actually the 24th chapter. But I want to read a passage. Paul, which gave us two-thirds of the New Testament, which had an experience with God on the Damascus Road, and God began to enlighten him. In 13 years, he separated himself from the backside of the desert, then came out and founded 13 of our major churches throughout the world in his day, Asia Minor, taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Says to the Roman Empire, when to the church in Rome, he says these words, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Everybody say, I'm in love with God. Because he loves me. How many of you know you can't waver on that love? That power, that anointing is there. But this is the real statement that I want us to really hone in on or really tune into from the Word. When it says this word, for I am persuaded. Everybody say persuaded. persuaded. Now the word persuaded in the Greek words means to have one thought that has now been changed to a concrete or a positive, powerful thing that cannot be moved. Now, the word persuasion has a great meaning in our society. Uh, if you're a vacuum salesman, please forgive me, but have you ever had someone that sold vacuums come by your house? Yes. And you know, man, you know, you, you got a vacuum. You might have four vacuums, I don't really know, but you know, you got a vacuum, and you have a vacuum, and uh, you know, their vacuum is the best. I mean, it will take the mites, the dust, the dirt, the color, everything right off your carpet. I mean, it will just suck it all up. Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? And, uh, you know, they are trying to persuade you to change your mind about what you have for something better. Now, how many of you know what God had to offer us can't get any better? So if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you've been persuaded like it or not. He knocked on your door of your heart, not as a salesman, but as a savior. And he said, no one can do for you 
what I can do for you. But Paul says these words, For I am persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any created thing shall be able to separate me from the love God has for me in Christ Jesus. Amen. In other words, he's saying to us that that means we need to be persuaded about that. And that not only we need to be persuaded, but there are elements in our life that tries to get that away from us. And can I tell you, a lot of times in our life, there are things that begin to happen that try to take the love of God. In fact, I don't know how to put it, but like the rubber meets the road, it's like trying to kick the love of God out of your life. Yes, amen. Because of circumstances or hurts or sicknesses or financial things that happen in your life. Or maybe your kid's gone bonkers and you're about ready to pull your hair out. How many of you know it's time to pray for them? Amen. Amen. Come on, church, are you there? Or maybe it just seems like that all things are breaking loose, but how many of you know the greater one lives in you? Yes. And that you need to be persuaded about that. And I can't come by to tell you, you have to experience this persuasion for yourself, and it's Jesus is the one that knocked on your heart. But how many of you know, Paul is warning the Roman church in Rome that there's a danger of drifting. That you can be persuaded, but how many of you know something else can take that persuasion away from you? In fact, in Hebrews it says these words, Therefore we must give most earnest heed to the things which we hear, lest we drift away. In other words, there becomes a danger. And we first talked about this in our first class where basically we talked that the anointing of God is good, it's for us, God is not against us, but at the same time our world is trying to get us to drift. Right. To just go through the motions of Christianity. To just say, well, I'm a Christian but have no fruit thereof. And Paul says, unless we heed to what we heard, unless we heed to what the Word of God tells us, how many of you know there's a real danger in drifting? Yes. And some of the reasons we drift is because many times we take our salvation for granted. How many of you know your salvation was free to you, but it cost Jesus Christ everything on the cross? Amen. Number two, we begin to talk about drifting can come through not using our gifts. How many of you know just sitting on the sidelines and not being in the game? On Super Bowl Sunday, I talked about, are you in the game? Because how many of you know that on Super Bowl Sunday, those guys had to be in the game? There might have been other problems going on in their mind, but how many of you know they had to get focused on really what was important at the moment? And I want to tell you, I talked, if you remember, about God being the coach, and we're the team, and we need to understand some greater things about ourselves, and we do this as teamwork, not as individuals. The word says, do not forsake the assembling together of yourself. Do not forget to come together as is a manner of some, even more so as the darkness draws in our world. So we've got to understand that we need to stir up our gifts. Everybody say gifts. Yes. Just look at your neighbor. Say, you're gifted even if you don't feel like it. <laughs> we also have to understand we can danger and drift if we don't believe the truth. How many of you know that that's really what the enemy wants is the truth? He wants to take half-truths in our lives instead of the true word and the true power of God. We also talked about the danger of drifting if you don't have a prayer life. Everybody say pray. pray. Just say pray changes things. Pray changes things. Now say pray changes me. Prayer changes me. That's the biggest thing it changes, let's be honest. And then it says these words, we drift because we forget about the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit. He said that I don't make you orphans. I send one that will be your comforter in time of need. How many of you know, I don't tell you, I'll tell you now, no matter what you're going through in this place today, you have some power through God if you know Him to get you through it. Yes. The biggest thing is you don't need to camp out there. That's right. Don't pitch your tent in the middle of the valley. Get on the mountaintop. Because how many of you know that on the mountaintop is where really we see God, but it's in the valley where we really determine and make choices? Come on, church, are you here? Amen. And so, with that being said, we went to the Old Testament. We began to look at a man named Joshua. You remember, remember the story of Jericho and Joshua and how the walls came down. And, but how many of you know he was a real man? He made choices. He had been a slave of Egypt. But now, 40 years later, he's getting ready to take the people into the promised land. Moses has died. And now he's walking in doubt 
of what God wants to do. If there's anything I see in our world today, it's an eyes full of doubt. It's lives full of fear. Lives full of uncertainty. When how many of you know that you don't have to live like that if you have a made-up mind? Because in Joshua 24, after all of his life, after all of the battles and all of the kingdoms that they had to destroy, the people of God that lived in the promised land begin to drift. They had forgotten what God had done for them. And so Joshua calls them together, and this is what he says in verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in certainty and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in the land of Egypt. Serve the Lord, and if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day. Everybody say choices. choices. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers in Egypt and on the other side of the river and of the gods of the Amalekite in whose land you now dwell. But then he makes this statement. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. How many of you know that's a choice? Now Joshua lived to 110 years old and now he's standing before all of Israel and he's saying... Choose you this day, make a choice. If it seem evil to you, then go back to those gods. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I am making a choice not only for me, but even for my whole household. That's right. Now, we've been talking, if you will, about some of these things. And first we talked about how could Joshua make a decision like that? In chapter 1, we see the power and the anointing of God. He realized he was a son of God and no longer a slave of Egypt. How many of you know, unless you can understand that the world doesn't have the ties on you that you think it does, that your worldly powers is now only a figment of the things that are happening to you, but the greater one lives in you and you are a son of God and you might have bad things come in, but your God's big enough to take care of those things. If you don't believe that, how many of you know you're still a slave to your circumstances and a slave? To, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. And I'm about ready to shout myself. I'm getting happy up here. Just preaching to myself. But we got to understand. Just say amen. Try it. Amen. See, it doesn't hurt. I said one time, you know, if you say amen to me, it's like saying sick him to a bulldog. I just feed on that. So I just want you to know if you want a good sermon. <laughs> well, some of you are out there. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Um, but you've got to understand that we can no longer be slaves to the world. We are sons of God, according to Romans. We are sons and heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And we've got to begin to believe that. Joshua knew that. The word says that clear back 40 years ago in Numbers, when he came back with a report and they sent the 12 spices, he said, he stilled the people when they were moaning and saying there's giants in the land. And he said, if God be for us, he can deliver this land into our hands. Right. And for 40 years, he never forgot the promise and the words he spoke. Amen. How many of us say yes to God and we know that he has victory and we know that he has power and we know that he has authority, but we have a tendency to forget tomorrow what he did today. And I even said last week where we look at today and think that everything is going wrong when you have to understand you can't always go by what you see today. Tomorrow's a new day in the Lord and a new sunrise. And all you have to do is begin to lay that at Jesus' feet. So we've got to understand the power and the anointing of God. Pastor Sandy now will tell me this when I go home and I'll pay for this later. But... <laughs> um, she always says, you want them to clap and say amen, but you never shut up long enough to give them a chance. <laughs> so, <laughs> Come on, church. Are you here this morning? Church should be the greatest time of your life during the week. Amen. Joshua also knew he was chosen by God. Church, you're chosen. 
The word of God says in Joshua 1.15, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. For as I was with Moses, so I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Man, he's making him a promise. He said, man, you didn't really choose me. In fact, Jesus echoes this in the New Testament when in John 15, 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you. Just turn to your neighbor and say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. Not frozen. I mean, you've got to know that the power and the anointing and the blessing of God, that you are a chosen person. Joshua knew he needed the word of God in his mouth. Everybody say, in my mouth. In my mouth. Everybody talks about their heart, but really the word says that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. So sure, you can have the word in your heart, but how many of you know you need to get it to your mouth? In fact, Joshua says this. In Joshua 1.8, God promises him these words. He says, but the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may be able to observe what you have heard and is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will be blessed. Right. In other words, he's saying the words, I'm either blessing or cursing my life with what I'm doing and what I'm saying and the anointing of God that's in my mouth. Because my mouth is where my problem is, and my mouth gives me away, you know, I don't know how many of you believe in the powers of darkness, but I want to tell you, God, through his infinite power, has not delivered this earth all from darkness, and Satan has the right to traffic in darkness. God gave him that right. And if we walk in darkness and Satan is buffeting us, it's not Satan's fault. It's because we haven't lit the word of God and put it in our mouth to fight against Satan. In St. John 10 or excuse me, in St. John 4, we see where Jesus was tempted by the enemy, and the word says that out of that anointing in Matthew also, that he spoke the word to defeat him. That's right. How many of you know you won't defeat the powers of darkness with your own words, but you will defeat them with the word and the power of God? Amen. And this is why the enemy hates the word, or will even quote the word wrongly, or half-truths, when you are promised certain things and that anointing that is in you, but you need the word of God in your mouth. Everybody say, in my mouth. In my mouth. Then we talked about you will never rule your life if you fear people. Right. How many of you know you can't always go along with the crowd? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, it is sad, but there is a, a statistic in our world. Do you know that it is a known fact that some of the most heinous crimes that are ever committed are committed by gangs? And that it is a known fact that many of them, if they were running alone, would not even do what they do. But there is a thing called pack mindset. Where you'll do things with someone else that you wouldn't even do alone. Well, you know, it works the same way in the positive realm. If you run with the right people... You do the right things. You begin to run. Come on, church. Amen. You begin. You all have been here long enough to know, man. I mean, I preach where the rubber meets the road. This is where we really live. That our friends make a difference. That what we listen to and put into our eye gates and ear gates really makes a difference of who we are. Because there is, whether it's good or bad, a pack mindset can either be good for you or bad for you. And Joshua realized this. So what he did is he began to understand that, listen, I can't always go with a popular crowd. Sometimes I'm going to have to speak the smaller crowd just so I can go with God. Amen. That's right. yes. Come on, church, are you here? Right. Because I want to tell you, you don't always get popular because you make the right stand. <laughs> Prime example, really, of this is there's a great commercial out right now. I don't know how many of you saw it. It's about a basketball team playing in a championship game. And a kid loses the ball, and the ref says the other team touched it and went out of bounds, and so he called it for the team's favor. Well, he called a timeout and all huddled up. And when they got in the huddle, the kid that was handling the ball said, Coach, I touched the ball last. It should be going the other way, not in our favor. And one of the kids spoke up and said, Well, don't you understand? This is the championship game. Well, don't you understand that, you know, you shouldn't tell anybody that. And he said, well, coach, I touched it last and it went out of bounds. And the coach said, 
go tell the ref. And at the end of the commercial, this is what it says. Truth and integrity, pass it on. Yes. How many of you know it isn't always going? If he would have went with the crowd, how many of you know he would have done different later? Yeah, that's right. Come on, preach. I remember hearing a story years ago about a young man, and I've always tried to really live this and open this from a ministry's side and point of view, that it's the small decisions that makes the difference of how I walk either not in fear or in fear. And a man was standing at a counter, and they were buying coffee one morning, and, and he said, I'll pay for it, two of them. And, and he reaches over and gives the cashier a 10, and they gave him change for a 20. And the guy notices it that's with him, that he's buying the coffee for, and the guy just goes, shh, shh, and he puts it in his pocket. 20 years go by. Now this guy is the boss of the one that took the money. And he's now in the management part, and there's another managership opening up in another part of the country. And this man in the boardroom's name is coming up that put the money in his pocket. And he said to the boardroom, if for $10 that man would make that decision, what would he do if he was handling millions? It's not the big decisions you make in life, church. It's the little decisions you make. And that's why I've always been careful on what decisions I try to make and the choices that I make because I know that sets the course of my life for tomorrow. Come on, are you here? Amen. Because see, so often we forget that if we fear or we go with the crowd, see most of the crowd would have said, yeah, take the money. How many of you know that that's not walking in the power and the love of God? When $10 changed his entire life and his income, was it really worth the $10? See, how many times do people make choices because they don't recognize there's the bigger picture? Come on, church. Yes. There's so many things in our lives. Joshua knew also that he had to speak the power and the word of faith. He began to speak the positive things. He said, no man can stand against me. God promised me that I will be able to overcome, and this is our promised land. But thirdly, Joshua did something that we need to recognize today. And that is, Joshua recognized that he not only needed to speak faith, but he recognized that he needed to leave a mark for the next generation. How many of you know that really in today's society when it's eat it all for myself or take it all for myself, Joshua recognized that there was a power of making a statement for the generation to follow. In fact, these are the words that he says in Joshua 4. And the children of Israel did just as Joshua had commanded them. They took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan. As the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, and they carried them over to the other side to where they were lodging. And they laid them down. And then in verse 19, this is what it says. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they carried to Gilgal, to the east of the Jericho, and they brought the twelve stones and, that they took out of the Jordan, and Joshua said to them in Gilgal, when your children ask what this is, this pile of stones, tell them it's when God delivered us. Yes. See, in a today's society, when we only think of self, how many of you know that we really lose the real power of what God wants? God is saying to us, in fact, I guarantee you there's not a person in this room that somebody hasn't laid a stone somewhere for you to be where you are today. Yeah. What are you leaving behind? Are you piling the stones so that when your grandkids ask, you can say, this was my God. He set me free right here. Amen. Amen. Are you leaving stones so that when people ask and the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that can say, my great grandpa, my great grandma prayed for me and I'm where I am today, serving God, delivered from drugs, set free because they left a stone behind for me to see. That's good. That's good. Come on. 
See, in a generation that only thinks of themselves, how many of you know, it's a little hard to preach these things that we need to, if we're affecting all people that come after us, and it isn't just our own family, this was an entire nation that affected. What are we leaving? We're saying that America is really a messed up right now, but what kind of stones are we leaving them? Come on, church. Is it all about us? Is it just me? Is it what I can get out of life? Or is it the real power and the anointing of what can I leave? Maybe it's my age or something, but you know, I think more now of where I'm headed and what I really want to leave. I don't know about you, but I want to leave something for somebody else to build on. I want to leave, yeah, God blessed us. And I mean, I remember 20 years ago when we didn't own a table and we had five people coming to this church. But how many of you know it isn't about what I can leave for myself today? It's about where this church can go tomorrow. Amen. It isn't about what I can consume. It's about what can I leave. And church, I want to tell you, the only way you can really be wise and make good decisions and have a made-up mind is to recognize that it's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's about what can I do for somebody else. How can I lift somebody else? How can I leave a stone for them to say that I recognize out of that stone that's where Pastor Steve was delivered. That's where Pastor Steve was set free. When my grandkids grow up, I don't want them to live in the world. I want them to live because there's been a heritage left behind for them of words and piles of stone that they can follow. Amen. And some of those stones are tough. I don't know if you realize this, but in the Himalayan mountains in the summer... When the snow melts off, there's a pass there that passes through. And the way people find their way through that pass is piles of stones of people that have gone on before them. Because it's treacherous and it all looks the same. But when they come across those piles every so many miles, they know they're on the right track. And if they don't pass that in a certain amount of time, then they have to back up and find that pile of stones so they know they're going the right way. Now let me tell you about the pile of stones. Do you know what those piles of stones are? Graves of people that didn't make it. It isn't always about the victories that we pile stones, church. It's sometimes about the tragedies. That's right. But we build a Bethel there because God delivered us from there. That's right. And we go from there to the next place. Come on, church, are you here? Yes. Because we have to understand that it's more than just about what we consume. And sometimes it's tough. Yes. It's not easy to leave an inheritance. It means something I give to somebody else that I don't consume. But how many of you know I can never really understand the real power and the anointing of God until I'm willing to leave? I'm preaching really good here. I don't even mind saying it on the camera. I'm preaching really good here. Because we have to understand where we are, church. And lastly, let me close with this in just a few more moments. Joshua not only knew how to leave stones... But he reminded the people at the end of his life what God had done for them. How many of you know God does things not by chance but by divine appointment for you? You are blessed because of what Jesus Christ did. Amen. Joshua 24 says this before he makes this statement about me and my house. This is what he does. Then Joshua gathered the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, and for the heads, and for the judges, and the officers. And they presented themselves before the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, and now look down at verse 20, or 13, and it says, I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them, and you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in the sanctuary and in truth. Put away the gods which the fathers of your, your fathers followed across the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And then he says, for as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. After he tells the people everything they've done. Now the New Testament echoes this through the lover of Jesus, John, in Revelations, 
when he begins to tell us these words, he says in Revelation 12, 10, Then I have heard the loud voice in heaven. Now Savior and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ has come. And this is what he says. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And the word of their testimony. Now let me say something. There's anything you can do about the blood. Jesus settled that. Amen. But how many of you know there's a whole lot you can do about your testimony? Amen. Now this word testimony has a real unique word. As you look it up in the Greek, it's actually where we get the word witness or to testify. It is a legal term in our society where we call a witness to testify about what they saw or seen. And not hearsay. For it is inadmissible in a court of law if it's hearsay. But you have to see it. What can you testify that God has done lately? Hallelujah. Come on church, are you here? <laughs> has God done anything for you lately or he's just a sugar daddy when you need him? Hallelujah. No, the word testify literally means to be a witness, to proclaim the truth. To preach, just turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a preacher and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> to preach the gospel. Isn't this good? I tell you, we need to begin to understand, man, the blessing. See, this is why at the end of his life he could say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, is because he recognized that it was the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony that set them free. Isn't it time that we open our eyes again to what God has seen for us? That greater one lives in us than the problems that we're walking through. That the greater one can overcome for us. The greater one can stick up for us. If somebody crossly accuses us or wrongly accuses us or lies about us, guess what? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I'm bigger than that situation. Why? Because I know the power of the witness and the anointing and proclaiming the truth. For I know the truth will set me free. And I don't have to pick up for myself, defend myself. I know because I've witnessed what God can do. The greater one is there for me. I can proclaim the truth and it will make me free. I can preach and open my mouth. And I don't mean just from this pulpit, but I mean every day. So many times, it's crazy, we think to be a witness means to go to Africa or somewhere. And all these people are, let me go on a mission trip. Let me go on a mission trip. Oh, it's so great to go to Mexico. It's so great to go to Africa. It's so great to go to the Mideast and see the way people receive the Word of God. What about your neighbors? What are, you, are you only a witness in another land? Now let me tell you what Jesus says about a witness in Acts when he's talking to the church as he just, just before he ascends and sits down at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you and me. These are the words he leaves to the church. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the day nor the season which your Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has came upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has came upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, for me, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. What good does it do us to travel around the world to tell about Jesus if we're not willing to tell about him to our neighbors and the people we pass by or someone we run into that wants, is going through something? What good is... Yeah, sure, it's exciting. I mean, I've been, to, I've been around the world preaching the gospel anymore. I was in Russia and there was 300 people that gathered and all we did was play a little guitar and I ministered for five minutes and over 200 people gave their heart to the Lord. Now, man, that's exciting. Yes. But guess what? We've had 13 people saved in the last month in this church. That's just as yes. exciting. Yes. Isn't it time we be Woo! Glory to God Woo! in the highest because I want to tell you, you know, we're not just witnesses overseas. We're witnesses to the power and the love and the anointing of God right here in America. But Jesus said, what about you? Are we opening our mouth? Are we sharing? Because, you know, he first said, Jerusalem. If we don't do it at home, what good does it do us to do all this other stuff? If we don't do it in Samaria, which is right here. If we don't do it in Judea, which is where Jesus lived. 
If we don't do it where we live, what good does it do to travel the world to preach? I'm, hallelujah. Because that's what a witness is. Don't you have something good to say about Jesus to somebody? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's preaching right to me right now. What about to proclaim the truth? What's the truth in your life? Does the greater one live in you? Does the anointing of God carry? Do you have faith to overcome? See, when you do, then you can say at the end of your life, as for me and my house. Why? Because he recognized that if he would tell about the goodness of Jesus, look at what he said. He didn't say, I'm going to serve the Lord the rest of my life. He says, as for me and my house, everybody that's under my roof is going to know the power and the love of God. See, and that's really proclaiming the truth. The truth is God doesn't want to just save you. He wants to save your entire family, your neighborhood, yes. the city you live in. He wants to deliver and, and set free. I'm going to try that over here. Yeah. I mean, we need, to, yeah, we need to understand. This is like, I mean, you know, the truth is something that's unique. I, I feel sometimes like Jeremiah. I don't know about you, but, you know, have you ever got mad at God? I know you all are looking at me like me, you deer in the headlights right now or something. Don't give me that. I've got mad at God even. And I usually pay for it when I do. <laughs> kind of like when I mentioned Pastor Sandy from the pulpit, you know. I, <laughs> I hear about it later. But it's good. She, she's really kind to me. <laughs> I love you, honey, and there's nothing you can do about it. Hallelujah. Um, but... But you know, I, I've been upset at God. Nobody in here has ever been upset at God but the preacher. Man, I better sit down and let you stand up here and preach. <laughs> but you know, when you get mad at God, I, I feel like Jeremiah because I don't know how you are in my life, but you know, I've been frustrated with maybe something that happened or somebody didn't treat Russ right or they're saying bad things about the church. And you know, man, I'm, I'm like a daddy. I mean, I'm protective of the church, you know, and I think, man, I got to go straighten them out. You know, anybody ever feel like that? <laughs> Well, let me put it on your level. Anybody ever pick on your kid? You know, you wanted to pick him up and then knock him down and then pray over him. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know you would know about that. But, you know, do you realize that sometimes those things just come our way to see, you know, what we're really going to do with that? And like Jeremiah, you know, you get frustrated and say, well, if God's like this and he's letting me go through this, but you know, really, the real power is if you have the Word in you and the Spirit of God is moving in your life. I mean, the real Word is like Jeremiah. He got mad at God and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. But you read the very next chapter and he says, but the Word of God is shut up in my bones and I cannot help but tell of God and His goodness. Amen. I don't know about you, but honestly, that's proclaiming the truth. The truth is God's good no matter what I'm going through. God's still on the throne no matter how tough it looks. And really Joshua understood that, that it wasn't just in the good times, but it was also in the challenging times. And then lastly, and let me just say this, we need to preach with power. People don't want to serve a powerless God, and we don't serve a powerless God. I mean, God was so bold. He says in... in uh, in the epistles, he says these words. He says, And Jesus triumphantly triumphant over him. And literally, not only triumphantly triumphed over him, but he made a show of him openly. That's right. And this is, this, is, this is the really, I guess, the word, I, the, the, the power I love. It's, it says this in 2 Corinthians 11.10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from boasting. Boasting of my God. I mean bragging. My daddy can whip your daddy. Uh -oh. That kind of stuff. You know, I mean, you know, my daddy is tough because in Romans it says God is my father. And no one can stand before him. So how many of you know that this is where we really find whether we serve God? This is where we really pull out the anointing of God. This is where at the end of our life, at 110 years... Some of you ought to shout right there. I'm surprised you didn't shout. <laughs> that we can say, as for me and my house, yes, we will serve the Lord. Yes. 
As for me and my house, I'm not giving up because I know the one, the greater one that's in me. I know the one that has the anointing. I serve a God that's greater than this world I live in. And I serve a God that's greater than any problem I have. Amen. And see, that's testifying. Like I said, the blood you can't do anything about, but you can about your testimony. Yes. Because, you know, some people, they use it like a money. They don't testify, they testimony. <laughs> Maybe only the first service got that, I'm not quite sure. It's, should have stayed there. There's some monies, yeah. There's no monies in this house, right? Amen? That's why you guys didn't recognize that. Come on, church, did you get anything out of that this morning? <laughs>